beach. I've swum and walked and done my stand-up board each day. And I think of so many others who've suffered in public mm. housing or maybe they're homeless and I feel a little bit guilty about uh, how blessed I am. But, uh, yeah, I, I've done well. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm glad you're in good, good health and, and good spirits. So I guess the first thing we've got to ask is what's been the immediate effect of this pandemic on the aid sector? What, what's, 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 the, what's the initial kind of boom or bang that, that's, that's happened? Well, the immediate effect is uh, countries understandably have said, we're closing our borders, we're looking after ourselves, we're turning inwards. Uh, that trend existed pre-COVID-19. Uh, apart from a global collaboration for a vaccine or treatment, uh, the World Bank's uh, predictions that 500 million people will be forced into poverty, and we've been do doing very well lifting people out of poverty, extraordinary achievements, Millennium Development Goals, Sustainable Development Goals, but almost certainly dramatically going backwards. Um, you know, it's, it's very curious, Michael, never has the world had a global consciousness like this. When have we ever experienced the same thing at the same time? Anxiety, shut in, uh, economic uh, restructuring, loss of jobs, uh, morbidity rates from country to country on our news, infection rates. And yet that uh, biological connection that all of us are vulnerable, Infection anywhere potentially affects us all everywhere. Think of Martin Luther King Jr.'s injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Well, this is absolutely true of infection, but we've seen competition in who buys PPE and masks. Uh, we've seen poorer countries missing out. We've seen a sort of rampant nationalism and it's curious and sad that the wealthiest nations in the OECD have been the first and most severely hit. Why? Because we fly more and we travel more. Mm. My friends in Africa are saying for the first time Africans, poor Africans, are socially ostracizing and isolating themselves from the rich. They're saying, you guys are dangerous. You've hit, lived the high life and put us at risk. Nonetheless, uh, this global consciousness, which might say, A, therefore, because we're all affected, should be being increased, is almost certainly going to be cut in so many nations just while we look at our own mm. recovery. So that's a, that's a quick takeout. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought the effects would similar. I mean, a lot of these countries have been hit very hard, but at another level, the effects are not evenly distributed. So some countries that don't have quite a robust health system can find themselves in, in, um, in more dire need. You know, they may not have all the ventilators that they're required to have. Uh, and there's also been incidents, uh, certainly Australia and the US and other places, of racism directed towards Asians. So that's what I see some of the negative consequences um, of this. And yeah, we do want worry about what this could mean for budgets in the future as people try to, you know, tighten resources around what they want to do in their own neck of the woods, let alone looking around uh, the world. Uh, that, so that's what's happening now. What are some aid organisations doing at the moment? What, 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 is, what are some of the best practices that are happening for those who are at the front end of dealing with countries, or particularly, I, th I think of you know refugee um, settlements or situations where you know the, the 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 virus may be coming to them. What's happening on the front line, Tim? Well, aid organisations are trying to just tell the story in ways that highlight how blessed uh, some of us are. Uh, how do you uh, physically isolate when there's twelve families to a refugee tent in Jordan and Lebanon? Uh, how do you wash your hands five, six times a day when mothers who are refugees say, we only have enough water to wash our kids once a week? How are we meant to do what you're recommending? Um, aid organisations have been trying to tell the story that Australia has dodged the bullet. It has uh, been able to suppress the virus, but 
uh, we can't fully open up and we're an export nation. The virus could come in on export goods. Therefore, Micro Australia is beginning a campaign called End COVID for All, that none of us are safe till all of us are free of the virus. And uh, we are going to be bringing in ambassadors to actually say, you know, Australia, we've been blessed. Uh, think of Africa, 20 nations don't even have one ICU ventilator. South Sudan has four ICU ventilators. Australia now has 7,000 up from 2,000. And uh, we've got uh, uh, only about 100 beds uh, being used. Um, one good news story with uh, Jewish friends here. Uh, we worked with the government of Israel, then with Greg Hunt. And we said, can we just get 20 ICU ventilators? They cost about $20,000 to the Palestinian territories. The government of Israel don't want to publicize it for political reasons. Mm -hmm. Greg Hunt was terrific. He responded to me. He said, we have so much capacity here. Yeah, we can spare 20. So really end COVID for all is a campaign which uh, we'll be launching saying to Australians, we are blessed, we have capacity. We can do more, don't cut aid. In fact, our nearest neighbours from Papua New Guinea are our responsibility. We have 36 doctors for every 100,000 Australians. Papua New Guinea has one doctor for 100,000. And if their nurses or doctors fall ill on the front line, well, they're only three, four kilometres from Australia. This is enlightened self-interest as well as fundamentally as a Christian saying these are our people are our responsibility who carry the image of God. Okay, well, that's great, Tim. I mean, my next question was going to be on what can Christians do now? And it sounds like end COVID for all is a great idea because until we eradicate uh, this virus all over the world, uh, it's always going to be a threat. That's something that's going to reappear and pop up with similar dire and dangerous consequences. Uh, once this COPE campaign, uh, no, uh, End COVID Everywhere, uh, begins, what would you like to see Christians doing? Well, really to have uh, what we call watch and pray vigils. So we're going to be calling on Christians to go a whole night without sleep. So it's quite sacrificial to watch and pray. Uh, to tell your friends that you are going for a whole night without sleep because that is how long people are waiting in poor countries with uh, fragile health systems, and they still may not get treated. Uh, to bring home the reality that we actually get treated and have resources. So you literally feel it in sleeplessness, but watching and praying. We're gonna be inviting Christians to, uh, uh, as they watch and pray, get friends to sign a petition to say, Australia, even with all the terrible economic realities we face, we still are blessed and we still have responsibilities and we shouldn't be cutting aid. In fact, we should be increasing aid uh, until we've ended COVID for all. So it's a watch and pray vigil as a spiritual discipline that really says, Mike, you know, at the end of the day, even though I'm very patriotic as an Australian, I I watched every ball in the Ashes test last year and I uh, was thrilled we retained the Ashes without using sandpaper. I love Australia, I'm patriotic. But my first priority is as a Christian uh, and the first claim of my life, not just as a nationalist Australian. Uh, I am pleased Australia's closest borders has got this under control, but my first claim on my life is as a Christian. And uh, this watch and pray in COVID for all is a campaign uh, that we hope so many Christians will be part of. Yeah, well, it sounds like a great idea, Tim, a great idea. Uh, can you, can you, do you have any other good news stories for us? Uh, not just like in, like in the Palestinian territories, are there any other good things that are happening that we should be taking notice of and getting excited about and, and hoping we can perhaps replicate them or continue them in the future? Yeah, the, the other good news story in other parts of Africa than South Africa, governments which often uh, 
uh, we criticize for corruption or for self-interest. This time have by and large, and I'm generalizing, acted quickly. The uh, history of experience with HIV AIDS, with Ebola, has given them antenna to say, we know we have to act. And the shutdowns and the protection and the closing has been swift, which is why you're not seeing, other than South Africa, uh, yet rapid spread of the virus. The shadow side of that is for many Africans who can't go to market because markets are shut, how do they eat? Mm. Uh, just a stay at home order. So um, right at the moment, uh, we're praying that the virus may uh, be stopped in its tracks in Africa. Uh, South Africa is the worry, and why South Africa? Again, it's a wealthier country, so it had international flights and links uh, of trade. That's, that's the reason, uh, much more than other countries. Yeah, we had a, there's a student connected with Ridley whose uh, eldership from his church went to a conference in South Africa and three of them ended up getting uh, the, 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 uh, the virus from the trip to South Africa and one of them fell quite gravely ill and was on a ventilator. So, yeah, I, I can, I mean, that sort of touched us here, home at Ridley. Okay, well, thank you for sharing that with us, uh, Tim. Uh, we also have on the line, uh, we have Isabel Blackett, who is a sanitation engineer. Uh, are you there, Isabel? Sam, yes. Now, uh, you're, you're... Greetings from um, uh, Essex in the UK. Okay, Essex. Essex, apparently a fairly good cricket side in county cricket, from what I remember. Uh, although that may be meaningless to you, Isabel, and the vast majority of our listeners. Uh, mainly for Tim's benefit and edification. I liked it. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad. Now, um, I Isabel, um, how, how did you get into the aid sector? And what's a nice Christian girl like you doing in sanitation? Right. Okay. Well, I was warned about this question coming up. Um, so I, I'll just, in a potted, um, in a short summary of that, um, I was a committed Christian as a teenager and I prayed. I prayed about what God wanted me to do. Um, I have to admit, when looking back, there were a couple missionary aunts, there were a couple missionaries in the family, the broader family, but I didn't particularly see any relevance of that to me. I mean, I had really no idea what God wanted me to do, but I was absolutely convinced that God had made me who I was, he knew me, and he had a plan. Um, I, and I was a mid, in my mid-teens, and I didn't know what that plan was, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I wanted to follow him. And I trusted that God would provide me a direction. And I had this thing in, that going around in my head of Samuel saying, here am I, send me. And over months, I was sort of getting to that age when you've got to choose subjects. Um, I had the faith that if I kept praying this, God would answer. Um, but of course, I had no, no idea what the implications of praying that prayer was. You only find that out later. And just before um, I chose my final subjects for my A-levels, um, I was on my knees, which I think I'd never done before, and it was a sign of being fairly desperate that I needed some direction. And I believe that God answered, and I had three words that came to me. Go and do what other people don't want to do. Go to where other people don't want to go, and help provide the basic needs for the poorest people. And that's all I had. Now, I was living in a rural village in England. Um, I actually didn't really know what that meant. It seemed um, clear to me. And I wrote three letters. Um, I only remember one was a UN agency and one was to Oxfam in Oxford. And the other one I've forgotten. But perhaps at the time it didn't strike me, but in retrospect, the first miracle on all of this in this path was that they all, they all answered and they all said the same thing. And they all said, go and get an engineering degree. And then I started on the path down that route. Um, and since then I've had quite a lot of very, very specific words of wisdom and support and encouragement, usually just when they were needed or to get me back on track. Um, and I've not always, though, I'm saying that Bill Walker knows me quite well and it's not always been easy and sometimes I've been quite confused about the path ahead. But eventually the, the bottom line of this is God gave me a mission, a mission to achieve something for the poorest people, not a career. And when people ask me what my career objectives were, I always say, I can't answer that question. I don't have a career. 
I am here to do what I can to improve basic needs for the poorest people. Anyway, to move on, I took the engineering degree and then I was led into a master's in water and sanitation for developing countries. And since then, I have almost entirely, but not entirely, worked with governments in developing countries, um, designing, developing, implementing, reviewing urban sanitation programs and hygiene. And they've always been focused on, and my motivation is that these programs don't just serve the wealthy areas with sewerage like we're used to in Melbourne, um, but they actually get to the poorest people in the slums and the uh, peri-urban areas of the towns and the cities. So my first job was as a volunteer um, working with toilets, hygiene, sewers, fecal sludge management in the Ministry of Interior in Lesotho in Southern Africa. And since then, I've worked quite long-term jobs in the government in Ethiopia, um, right in the middle of the government in South Africa at a very interesting time. I, in, Tim, I was very interested in your, um, in your uh, comment there, um, actually working within government to develop a sanitation program. And that was uh, just after the end of apartheid. So it was a very interesting time to be a white woman in a government department in South Africa. Um, and then just more recently, we've spent six years in Indonesia. And I've worked on much sort of medium term and shorter, shorter assignments across um, South Africa, uh, Southern Africa, East, East Africa, um, and Asia, and um, East Asia and South Asia. Um, during this time, I've worked for uh, the uh, aid, the government aid programs, the UK, Norway, Germany. I worked for 12 years with the World Bank, within the World Bank. Currently, I'm working quite a bit with the Asian Development Bank, and I've worked for UNICEF and for a lot of consulting companies and research organizations and training institutions, and also for World Vision Australia um, and WaterAid and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So a very wide range of types of employers doing a lot of different things. And I'm now working as a consultant, as already mentioned, for some of those people. So I would say, and I want to reflect now a bit on my calling as a Christian. Initially, I just took God at his word and I got on with it. But after a few years, I was asked occasionally to um, speak, as I am now, on what I was doing and why I was doing it. And it kind of forced me to look at the theological and look at the basis of why was God calling me to do this. My first thought was, is always that Jesus responded to the physical and spiritual needs around him. And he, he responds to the whole person and he showed his care for the whole person. And he often healed people or he provided for their physical needs as a demonstration of his spiritual power and his authority. He knew what people needed at a very deep level and he cared and he cared for them in a holistic way, spiritually and, um, and physically. But our situation is quite a different one now. Australia or the UK, it's the same. Where we live, our physical needs are not quite as extreme as they were in Palestine in um, 2000 years ago. And most people, but to be fair, not everyone by any means in Australia or the UK is taken care of by the blessings. And I, I really appreciated Tim's reflections. I relate to them a lot. We have the blessings of an adequate income. We have government, we have the private sector, we have regulation, we have a structure that functions and provides our basic needs and community organizations and a lot of freedom. And that works. But we live in a globalized world. And every day we hear the news, um, again, Tim's referred to some of this, and we hear it through many different channels, and we communicate, and most of the point, we use services, and those services are provided by people who are very far away. If we start looking, when we go to the shops, of where things are made, are made that we buy, we soon realize how connected we are. And in many of those places, the social and economic situation of those people that we are connected to is more like Palestine 2,000 years ago. Um, you, many people may have heard of the book of, uh, called Misreading the Scripture Through Western Eyes. And I mean, I find that a very influential and important book. And it actually looks at the situation in many developing countries, how many cultural and social aspects are more like uh, it, what Palestine was like in Jesus' day than, than the world we live in here. So the difference for me, the only difference there is, is that on a daily basis, when we are in Australia or I'm in the UK, I don't physically see these people in need. 
but we can't claim to not know about them and we cannot claim to not be connected to them. And so in being called to this work, um, and my faith is that what I'm doing is very consistent with what Jesus did. It's responding to people's physical and basic needs. And secondly, the other aspect of this is I see that throughout history, committed Christians who trusted God for their strength, their power and their guidance have been at the forefront of caring for marginalized people. In developing education and health services in the last two centuries ago and empowering people to live healthy and fulfilling lives in the service of God and the service of others. And for centuries, Christian women and men have established hospitals, schools, and public health systems, and they have led and been part of movements to abolish slavery, to reform prisons, and secure civil and physical, civil rights and racial equality. And in that sense, I felt very comfortable. I'm just continuing in that trend. I'm being part of that trend, working with sanitation systems, improving public health systems. And it's actually on reflection, there's nothing inconsistent or surprising that I'm doing this work. And I just my bottom line is God really cares for us and we must do the same. Okay. Thank you very much, Isabel. I have to admit, I was a little, a little bit confused because you said you were living in Essex and God had called you to go to the places where no one wants to go. And I remember thinking, I didn't think Essex was that bad. <laughs> You know, m maybe Blackpool I could understand, uh, but I mean, X is, X is, so you weren't talking about Essex, I'm glad about that. So and that sounds like God has um, used you in different places around the world. Uh, I mean, that, that's, um, that's quite a, some stamps on your passport you must have, from <laughs> Indonesia to Ethiopia to Southern Africa, also in Melbourne. I guess one of the things um, that, that I see amongst different Christian tribes around the world are different understandings of the significance of aid. Um, there are those who think that really we should replace the Great Commission with the UN Millennium Goals. I've seen that as kind of one view. I've seen another one, another one where it's like, well, we're all about saving souls. We're all about preaching the gospels and a relationship and health. That's just what you know government does. So you know, pay your taxes, let government do that. Um, how how do we avoid not to confuse, not to compartmentalize? How do we have an integrated view? Of, of, of aid, of welfare, of the sort of concern you've been talking about, what, what Jesus had. How, how do we keep these things integrated together so that we're, we're appropriating the sort of message that you get from Jesus, you get from the prophets, you get from something like reading the book of James? How do we have an integrated view of mission in today's world? I'll, I'll start off first with Isabel, and then I might go on to Tim for that one. I wasn't given this question in advance, so I'm going to have to ad lib, and I look, look to Tim to uh, add to what I miss. Um, I think within the church, we have a tendency in Western countries to focus on the spiritual over and above. Um, I, don't, I don't think we're very balanced between Jesus's call that we respond to people, we, um, physical and spiritual needs. I think it's partly because of what you said, is that we, our physical needs are largely taken care of and they've been taken over by the government and, and people are not and, and it's an enormous blessing we're not as in the desperate straits that people are were in um, 2000 years ago in Palestine but that isn't true about a lot of the rest of the world and if we realize that and we were able to um, not be frightened to engage with it more and I mean I think the work that Micah has done over the years I'm a little bit out of touch now so I was incredibly encouraged by what Tim's just told us about the MICA campaign. It, it, it's spot on in terms of an integrated um, approach to seeing the need to pray, to give, to do and act. And I would like to see a lot more young people encouraged to get out there and get stuck in to a whole range of things in Australia and overseas, but not just doing um, tr conventional missionary work and the spiritual side. Because I think that when we're doing uh, we're delivering the physical side. The opportunities I've had to share my faith are incredible because I've just been getting on with it. And it, as if you were working in a bank or any job in Australia, you get an opportunity to share your faith when you look for it. If you get out there and you do other things in other countries, exactly the same. 
Tim, I want you to add on to that rather incoherent. Well, I was going to say, Isabel, for a, for a um, for an impromptu answer, that was actually quite brilliant. I mean, to, to be perfectly honest. Um, but uh, Tim, ha I mean, you've you've probably dealt with this a lot across your career and the places you've worked. H how do we stay integrated in this rather than picking or choosing or compartmentalizing these things? Yeah, look, my journey was growing up uh, in an evangelical family, which I would now look back and say probably had what I'd call evangelical Gnosticism as its dominant view than what I would say is a full reign of God, kingdom of God theology, which, you know, Isabel put it beautifully. Uh, namely, Jesus says, well, what's easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or rise, take up your bed and walk. Whether it's physical or spiritual, it's the same reality. Um, evangelical Gnosticism in the sense that we didn't really believe that uh, the, there would be physical bodies in heaven. That just seemed odd. That seemed unbelievable. It would be our soul in heaven. And uh, therefore, the soul is, uh, is superior. Uh, and we, we then just focused on um, what we thought Paul meant with sins of the flesh being particularly sex and moral issues. Uh, actually. Paul calls sins of the flesh envy and uh, greed and a whole lot of things that really are on the mind. Paul was using flesh and spirit in a different way, I think, to the way we've, we've read it and separated out spiritual as higher and the flesh as uh, lower. Um, so for me, emerging from evangelical Gnosticism, if I can call it that, is, was really the sense that God's plan for the world isn't just a secret plan for those who know the language of Zion, who actually uh, can plug into it. It's a plan for the world to flourish. And with sin and brokenness and separation, anxiety from God, from the garden, anxiety is the signature of our times. This is the plan that actually brings together all of our psyche and spiritual and physical needs. Um, I was talking yesterday, sorry to name drop here, but it was for a podcast to Tom Holland. Some of you will know his book. Uh, I was talking to him last week. There we go. We, we talked to the right people, Michael. And Tom. Tom I loved him in Spider-Man. <laughs> Tom, who's almost through historical inquiry coming to faith uh, and uh, wouldn't call himself yet an active Christian, but has done this wonderful defense of uh, how Christian faith has made the West. And he said yesterday, and I was fascinated by this, he said, you know, no one, no one uh, gets surprised when a bishop, an Anglican bishop says, remember the poor, care for the poor, it's ho-hum. So Christianized even our secular people, uh, not knowing why, that is just de rigueur, it's just taken. He said, I wish bishops would actually say what secular people think is the weird stuff. Care for the poor because Jesus died on the cross for their sins. <laughs> he said, that weird stuff actually is the profound connection to why even in the West where the success of the message, and we should bank it, we should bank the uh, concern, evidence in Millennium Development Goals and aid programs, but it's almost been cut off from the root, the proclamation that God has a plan for the world for us to flourish, that uh, we need to be redeemed. Uh, and declaring that is fundamental to the work we do, the social action, the aid programs that we do. Um, he, Tom, Tom said, you know, Atheists who uh, are aggressive against Christianity in the West would be more honest if they were like Nietzsche, if they said Christianity, concern for the poor is a slave morality, we want concern for the strong, and the, the strong and the wicked do more excellent things, don't have a concern for the poor. He, he says, if, if they're not doing that, they're really just Christian atheists. <laughs> they, they're actually adopting uh, now, I don't want to set that up uh, in a, uh, a combative way, but I do want to say it's fantastic that we've got secular aid programs in the West. That is a fruit of the gospel. But we need to proclaim what the root of that fruit is. 
uh, otherwise we start we start to lose it. Yeah, I think that's definitely right. You know, we have a society where even our atheism is very Christian orientated in terms of what we're allergic to, what we're for, what we're against, and 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 that sort of thing. And the Christian message is not simply love or be good to one another. The Christian message is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself and praying for people, longing for the redemption um, of our bodies. Not redemption from our bodies, redemption of our bodies ahead of the renewal of the whole creation. And I think it's those three things, you know, renewal, redemption, reconciliation, they, they all go together and they touch every fabric of human existence, not something uh, as simple as a soul. Yeah, I think a good word from both of you. Uh, I want to move on to uh, one other question. And um, I'll start off first with Isabel. Uh, what are the current potential challenges in emerging nations when it comes to things like, you know, poor sanitation? Now, I know this is a question very much in your wheelhouse. So what's one of the, the major challenges we're confronting in this area? Well, oh, I don't know where to start, Mike. That's a huge question. I spent, well, I spent the last 30 years working on it. Okay, so, so all I, I would start off by saying the water and sanitation challenges remain absolutely immense. And all the pandemic has done, and I think Tim's already touched on it, is make the, in, what, what the dire situation has made it even worse. Um, and although I work daily in such a situation, um, even if at the moment, unfortunately, it's a bit remote, is I actually find it quite heartbreaking. And I find it, I don't know how Tim finds it, but I find it really quite hard to read and take in what's going on. Um, and to be honest, I have recently been... Um, Sort of turning aside from that and just getting on with the work in front of me because I found it very hard because I know so many people in so many situations personally and I'm feeling that. Um, I want to just, I've got four points here that relate to the messages that we in Australia and the UK have been told as basic to our, com our uh, COVID response. First of all, access to clean water. Tim's already touched on it in relation to refugee camps. Now, many people have access to clean water, but it's not in their house or their yard, and they have to go out to get it from somewhere. The water may be clean, but how do you stay at home and go and collect that water? First question. Secondly, when you, you and you may or may not have a standpipe where you can collect it, you may need to travel some distance, and you're poor and you can't um, buy soap to wash your hands. So those basic messages, stay at home and wash your hands. How can you do that? So you're told to stay at home, but you don't have a toilet. 2.5 billion people in our world that we are connected to don't have access to safe sanitation. What would you do, you, and there's what, 61 people on this thing, what would you do if you don't have a toilet in your house? Well, you have to go out. You have to go out and you have to find somewhere um, to, to defecate. Now, if you're in an urban area, just visualize a slum. What do you do? And if you're a woman or a girl, you're already putting your risk normally. This situation is now worse. You are more likely to get caught or harassed because you shouldn't be out on the street. So, thirdly, by definition, poor people in urban areas, they live in tiny houses, usually maybe a whole family in one room or two rooms if they're very lucky. How can they self-isolate? Again, Tim's already mentioned this. And finally, just visualize an urban slum. Everyone has seen those pictures. How can they social distance? So I want to break down what those are very broad generalizations. I, I, I have a couple. I wanted to go back to this good news thing that you, you asked for earlier. Um, with the picture across the developing world varies enormously, and so have the government responses. And I can say they've not all been as slow as the UK, which has been pretty appalling. Um, for example, in Vietnam, the government responded incredibly quickly before there were any deaths whatsoever. And the reason they did that is they'd been through the SARS crisis and the avian flu crisis. And people knew what to do, and they seem to have be actually a world leader. We're not hearing a lot about it, but they've almost entirely eliminated the virus. And we have every reason to believe what they're saying. So the situation is very varied. Um, I wanted to just touch on one anecdote from last week. I was on the video talking to a Cambodian colleague um, and he was telling me about 
you know, the situation there. And I said to him, if you don't believe what the government said, how on earth can you know whether there's any COVID cases or not? And he just laughed. He said, well, of course we know. Well, how do you know? And he said, well, social media, we're all on social media all the time. He said, there's no way the government could actually suppress this. So we didn't know what the situation was. And again, his analysis is that people are being very sensible, they're being very cautious, and not because the government's told them to, although the government has, but because of their previous experience with SARS and um, avian flu and other pandemics. And they also are linking into the ABC, the BBC, and the international news channels. So there's so something very positive in that story too. I, I'm not sure, I think I've diverted from your question, Mike, but I'll, so I'll stop. Well, you, you went on, you went to a very um, enjoyable place and I just had a good time following you wherever it was, uh, Isabel. That's terrific. Um, Oscar, Tim, is there anything you want to you wanna add to that uh, in, in terms of um, uh, some of the potential challenges that you can see uh, in, the, in the near future about dealing with the COVID crisis in some uh, very needy places? Yeah, look, the general challenges before COVID-19, the world was retribalizing. Hyper-nationalism was already in, in swing. And, uh, uh, you know, I said before, I'm patriotic. The difference with pa patriotism and nationalism is patriotism is love of place. I love Australia. Nationalism is when you say my place is best, it is first. My place, no matter what. And Australia now is discovering that uh, we do need world rules. Uh, there'd been a speech by our Prime Minister last year talking about negative globalism, and he was talking about the importance of nations and nationalism. There is an importance because we need tribes, we need to belong, we do need that. But now we're seeing with uh, China's response to us, because we are the first to call for an inquiry, uh, that uh, China and America can cut deals outside the world trade organizations where it appears now our barley is going to be picked up by US farmers outside world trade rules, just nationalism, because they're the biggest. And nationalism always advantages those who believe size, might is right. Uh, trade rules, other rules, including rules in dealing with pan pandemics are for all of us, whatever the size and the strength. So that hyper-nationalism uh, can hurt poorer nations, it can hurt middle nations, even like Australia, uh, when as Xi Jinping saying China first, or Putin, Russia first, or uh, America first, etc. I think the Christian message uh, has always been subversive. We do not exist to get uh, benefits from the state by stroking their back. We exist to actually say all who are made in the image of God are loved by God. And we see ourselves as their brothers and sisters. Now we know biologically connected to them. So equally vulnerable. Um, and this, you know, I'm 65 now. And uh, at the outbreak of this uh, crisis, I realized my fate as a 65 year old and older people is in the hands of others. It was a very humbling moment. You know, I've gone to every disaster over the last 16 years, and now I was told, sit on your couch and don't leave home. Very humbling, uh, that sense of, uh, but I must do something, and uh, what can I do? Well, I think uh, we need tribes, we need patriotism, but, the Christian message trumps nationalism. And uh, that's why Micah's campaign, End COVID for All, really is, we believe, a gospel campaign. Yeah, I mean, it'd be sad that the pandemic is actually going to create further international fissures, both uh, economically and politically at this time. And it'll you know, create bigger divisions between them and us who were in alliance with and that type of a thing. Whereas Christian needs to be Christi, Christians and, and Christian aid organisations need to be the ones who who go in between, who stand in the breach, who can appear as um, you know for all intents and purposes politically neutral or at least nonpartisan, and okay. simply do the good work that needs to be done, irrespective of political creed, religion, 
ethnicity. So although at the one level it's a, it's a dire time, uh, I, I, like to, I like to think that there are some good opportunities for Christians to operate in these contested spaces doing work that at one level I think everyone would acknowledge is a good work, helping you know, vulnerable um, deprived communities uh, during a time of heightened crisis around the world. Okay. Well, I'm yeah, very totally. much great. Yeah, I'm very much grateful we've been. I have some time with Isabel and Tim. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I've got my engineer here, my software engineer Wayne. Are we going to take some questions from people, Wayne? I think Isabel needs to head off. Well, I believe Isabel needs to head off. Um, you have a, either another Zoom meeting or possibly a county cricket game, uh, on one or the other of them. Um, before I do that, I've just been pointed out to me. There's a question from Belinda here. Um, what would your advice be to a young Christian engineer who's in their early career and finding it hard? International. Okay, um, can I say, send me an email, get it from Ridley, and I'm very happy to um, answer to that. I've, got a, I've been asked that question before, and I'd love to answer it. Okay, indeed. Thank you. Well, uh, Isabel, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for what you've contributed. And thank you particularly for your good work in sanitation engineering. May the Lord bless you, keep you, and make you prosper and flourish in all that you do, Isabel. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, everybody. I'm very happy to take emails or questions later. Bye. Thank you, Isabel. Now, I think we've got a bit of a Q&A going on. Uh, I'll now, read the questions. do I read the, the questions on the screen? Do I just read the questions on the screen, Wayne? Uh, I can read it. Uh, okay, you can read it because my um, site isn't that good. Unless you've got to in increase some font for me. So let's go with the first question read by Wayne. So I'm the voice behind the camera. Um, so you can't see me. So don't freak out. So first question, and I'm assuming this is going to Tim. It's coming from... Um, Joe Dean, do you think Christian NGOs will be merging in the future? New legislation in Australia, external conduct standards are putting more checks and balances in place. How will they affect global partnerships and NGOs, large and small? Yes, so this isn't just Christian NGOs, but all charities and NGOs are, are under extraordinary pressure. I uh, co-chair the Charities Crisis Cabinet, and um, something like 90% of charities only had three months reserves. So charities prided themselves, and this is domestic, large and small, as well as overseas. Charities prided themselves on um, money in and money out, not having assets and reserves, low overheads, and uh, with COVID-19, giving's not just flatlined, it's dipped. Um, and the latest figures show that uh, after COVID-19 and when JobKeeper finishes, something like 30% of charities may not be left standing, which implies mergers and acquisitions. Um, the story with international NGOs, so if you take a, a, a World Vision or a Tier Australia or a Caritas Baptist School, they each, they each have federated models. So to merge, you actually need buy-in from all the different countries where their offices are because they're quite uh, uh, nationally governed. So it's a very complex story to merge these organisations. Um, legislation in Australia won't require that. Uh, I heard a ref reference to legislation. I'm not sure what you mean there, but certainly the practicalities of how COVID-19 has uh, left uh, charities just bereft, the cupboard is bare, we'll certainly see some mergers. And you have a second question there, Wayne? Yeah, we do actually have a follow-up question, which I think would be quite um, good to answer. So what will the future of churches engaging with these NGOs look like? Yeah, so churches have already, and this is a good thing, stepped up. Uh, in the last 10 years, so many churches now have their own direct church-to-church -church relationship with an African church or Asian NGO. Uh, they send people on mission trips. Uh, um, 
there's, there's good and bad in this. The, the good is that uh, that's exactly what I think uh, the church is on about, as we were reflecting earlier. It's not just a, a, a spiritual niche, you know, we're in the, the business of a bit of spiritual guidance and the rest uh, we've uh, just contracted out. Churches owning this, I think, is really good. The bad part of it is um, often churches uh, make mistakes. Uh, now, having worked for World Vision, let me say in its 60 year career, World Vision's made every mistake there is to make. The only difference is we actually have reflected on it and practiced better development theory around community development, empowerment. A church goes in, we need a, uh, uh, someone to drill for water, great, we'll drill. Oh, you want a second one? Oh, great, we'll drill that. Oh, what's happened to the water table? What's happened to the villages uh, downstream? Uh, um, those sorts of mistakes are uh, uh, in terms of not learning about best practice, when you just start as a church, can be very damaging too. But to answer your question, churches are stepping up. They have adopted a holistic uh, kingdom of God theology, which uh, I think is really good news. Okay, I think there's, uh, there's another question. I think I can uh, read it. Um, yeah, uh, where can we learn more of the um, End of COVID for All campaign? Is that coming out on a website or is there going to be a big social media blitz? Uh, when are we going to hear more about this? Uh, what sounds like a very noble and a, and a very good campaign that's coming out soon. Yes, yeah, so uh, we, we tentatively had 25th of May. It might get pushed back a few days. Yet yeah, we, we are hoping you'll see it right across the media. We are going to go after sunrise and today in the... We've uh, lined up some uh, ambassadors, uh, medical people, and other culture bearers. Um, and it's really in a secular form saying to Australia, let's, let's be good mates to our neighbours and to the west, rest of the world. But being led by MICA with all the other uh, ACFID agencies, so that's the Save the Children and Oxfam and others. Uh, so there'll be a sort of secular messaging. But for churches, it really is this watch and pray vigil. It's a spiritual commitment with a focus on a health clinic somewhere in Asia or Africa and the story of the struggle to pray, to get people to sign up, potentially to give. Uh, certainly the petition to say to our government, almost certainly the government's likely to say, we're just gonna cut aid, we're just gonna focus on ourselves. Well, they've cut aid to its lowest level ever. Uh, already. Uh, it was highest under Bob Menzies at 0.5% of gross national income at 0.2%. Uh, the Brits are at 0.7% legislated. Uh, Scandinavians 0.8%. The Dutch 0.9%. We gave ourselves a leave pass. I remember having this awful conversation with Tony Abbott when he was Prime Minister and he and Joe Hockey cut aid. Ah, oh, Tim, Tony said to me, AIDS only for good times, Australia's in bad times. Well, that was 2014 and uh, we had very low debt. Uh, so um, we are fearful that cutting aid again will cost lives. So COVID-19 really has a focus on that, but it, you'll see it in the media and go to the MICA website, MICA Australia website. Okay, the MICA Australia re website sounds like they'll be the number one place to go to for that, to get more information on end COVID for all. Um, one other question that we've got here, Tim, is what's a good first step to learn about a holistic theology, uh, perhaps in relation to, do, to development? So what's a good place to learn about something like this? And I should, I should add here, Tim, uh, you've recently been cooperating with Ridley College to create a unit that can be done with online uh, for people who want to get into uh, a, a Christian view of aid and development. And you traveled with a, uh, a crew around places like India, explaining what World Vision is doing and, and talking about it. Uh, so could you, could you talk about how you could learn about it and, and what, what you did in developing this unit for Ridley College? Yeah, thank you. I, I thought this must be a Dorothy Dixer from you, this question, Michael. No, I mean, this is, it's, it's on the screen. It's on the screen, I promise. Uh, 
So uh, Ridley's Aid and Development uh, Online Unit, which we taught last year, uh, goes from Africa uh, to India. Wayne was there with me uh, filming a, a lot of this, but draws in a lot of people, not just from World Vision, but from others. And, you know, I personally think that this isn't just an optional thing for people who might have a bleeding heart and a little bit interested in social justice. I think as the questioner asked, this goes right to the heart of what it means to follow Jesus. Uh, and I uh, am very proud of the fact that uh, the biggest aid organizations in the world are Christian, that two thirds of the, the Australian public's giving to overseas aid goes through Christian organizations. This is a signature brand of really Jesus saying, I preach good news for the poor that God's heart really is for them. Um, that when it comes to the reach, you know, just take a world vision. World vision's footprint in Muslim countries is far bigger than Islamic relief. Uh, it's work in Afghanistan with um, imams teaching them how to read the Quran to protect women and children, lifting out verses, and imams saying, we thank Allah that God has sent Christian World Vision here to teach us. So unique opportunities which are evangelistic, you, be, you are very careful how you, in those contexts, talk about that, mm. that but profoundly gospel-centered, which is right at the heart of aid and development. So I, I really do hope some of you might take this course. Oh, terrific. Uh, well, in addition to that, Tim, um, how should Christians who you know, have an interest in this area be training themselves up to be doing aid work overseas? I mean, what, what kind of practical things can young Christians uh, do to set themselves up so they're qualified and capable of ministering in this sector? So there are wonderful courses in international development uh, that uh, you can do. The truth is that just about any uh, area that you work in, uh, aid organisations use. It might be marketing, it might be finance and banking, it might be HR, human relations. Uh, it certainly includes uh, some development skills. Um, the one catch I'd say is um, with localization, which is the idea that rather than just send Westerners to do it for you. We want to train up those who are local. Um, there's probably less jobs than even a decade ago just for Australians to go and be placed and do it because we're encouraging locals. But there are still jobs. Uh, when it comes to the church, the church uh, is truly an international organisation. You know, when the Apostle Paul said, neither Jew nor Greek. This was a profound statement about being international uh, and transcending just that nationalism I was talking about. So through your own church uh, and number of uh, churches you attend, there will be relationships and opportunities and being skilled to know that good development actually isn't just good intentions, that it is a set of skills is really important. So training yourself in development programs is, is very useful. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you for that, uh, Tim. That's, that's very informative, uh, very encouraging as well, I, I have to say, even though it's a kind of uh, dire and perhaps even depressing time when we look about uh, in our own culture and some other places around the world. But it's good to know that there are, there are opportunities, there are things that Christians can do um, to, to contribute to extending the kingdom of God, to you know, preaching good news to the poor, to proclaiming the year of the Lord's favour, that type of thing. Uh, I am afraid, though, that we are now out of time and therefore we can't get to any more questions. So I'm very sorry we, if we haven't been able to answer your question. But I would like to thank Tim. I'd like to thank you, Tim. Thank you for your, your service to World Vision, your service to uh, Australia, and most importantly of all, to the cause of Christ and his kingdom. And uh, I hope it's not too long before you can um, get off that couch 
and uh, you can be up and about doing all the things that we know you love to do out there, uh, enjoying time with family, friends, and also, as you continually do, uh, advocating for the charity sector in Australia. So thank you very much for your time, Tim. Thank you. That's a pleasure. For everyone else out there, uh, I'd just like to thank you for joining us. I hope you've really enjoyed this discussion that we've had about Christian aid and its future in light of the COVID-19 crisis. If you'd like to know more information about Ridley's uh, unit of study on uh, overseas aid, do feel free to contact the college and we would be very eager to share with you the details of that unit, or if you're just generally interested in Christian ministry, theology, and becoming more equipped to serve in your local church or even to go on overseas aid projects, we would be very happy to talk to you and help you in any way you, we can. So I'm Mike Bird at Ridley College. Thank you very much for joining us, and I hope to see you around sometime in the near future. God bless. that once was crowned